One of the new features of the conference this year is we're trying to get the audience more actively involved. And the first aspect of that is this audience response system device that you've all been given, the clicker, with the numbers on it. Uh, we're going to ask you through the course of the morning several questions, or not questions, but statements that we want you to respond to that, that speak to matters pertaining to the conference theme. And uh, we're going to get ready now, so get your clicker. Let's go to question one, um, Max. Okay, now, remember, one indicates you strongly disagree, two, that you disagree, three, that you're neutral. We don't expect a lot of those. Four, that you agree, and five, that you strongly agree. So the first question, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds, okay? The first statement is, government regulation hinders innovation. Tell me if you strongly disagree to strongly agree with that statement. We're going to talk about these later. All right, the second statement. Recent experience in the financial sector, oil exploration, mining, and elsewhere, proved that self-regulation of American industry was a myth. Let us know if you agree or disagree with that statement. 30 seconds again. All right, and the results? OK, statement number three. The federal government should prevent corporations from becoming too big to fail. Let us know if you agree or disagree with that statement. Okay, now I want to remind you that uh, the purpose of these uh, statements was to stir you up a little bit and, and, and to, uh, to get you rolling. So uh, uh, we're going to continue to try and do that uh, through the morning. Well, at this point, we're ready to begin the formal conference program, and it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dan Smith, the Dean of the Kelly School of Business, who will welcome you to the conference. Dan? Thank you, Stephen. And, uh, I'm sure none of us expected to start off the day with a quiz. It's like being back in college, so uh, that's tremendous. It's, you know, it's always an honor uh, to, to host the annual business conference along with our distinguished sponsors on the banner uh, behind us and we'll recognize them more formally at the luncheon. And I, I want to thank our uh, guests today, our speakers on the panel, and Gary Dick, who I'll introduce in a minute, for, for sharing their time with us. Um, ultimately, the quality of this event depends on your engagement. And, and our distinguished panel. So thank you again uh, for being here. Hey, the Kelly School is a really special place, as I don't have to tell any of you. We have an extraordinary group of faculty, and, uh, and you know that. And many of you know also about our students. And I want to just recognize this just for a minute, because what's really cool is a bunch of them said, we really want to come up here and listen to this conference, be part of it, and to meet some of our other alumni, excuse me, and business leaders um, in the community today. Many uh, Kelly students actually want to stay in the state of Indiana. I know that, that we often talk about the brain drain problem facing the state. We did a survey of about 2,000 of our students, undergraduate students, uh, last semester, and over 50% of them had a sincere interest in employment opportunities in the state. And I just want to uh, ask our students with us today to stand up, and, and the reason I want you to do this is for those of you who are not students in the room, you really need to reach out and spend a few minutes with these uh, young men and women today because whenever I spend time with a student, even if it's only a minute, you come away with a fundamentally different perspective on the world, they, they open your mind, they're just a delightful group of young men and women and uh, amazingly more professional than I was at that age. So uh, our students in the audience, can you just stand up and, and let us recognize you? Thank you so much. Y'all clean up pretty well. I'm not used to seeing you without sweatshirts and backpacks. Uh, anyway, uh, let me turn uh, our attention now to the conference. Uh, this, is, this is an extraordinarily timely topic, if I, as I don't have to uh, mention to any of you. And we're fortunate this morning to have uh, an extraordinary person serving as the, uh, as the moderator. Uh, Gary Dick, as many of you know, needs no introduction, but uh, let me at least briefly uh, describe a little bit about his background for those of you who may not be familiar with the details. He's the president and managing director or managing editor of Grow Indiana, 
and is the host of the widely acclaimed television program Inside Indiana Business that appears weekly on uh, WFYI TV and Wish TV. I can say with great confidence, for those of you, we all enjoy watching Gary Dick, but if you've ever thought about being a sponsor of the show, and this is my plug for Gary, he did not ask for this, but I have to tell you, the Kelly School has been a longtime sponsor of Inside uh, Indiana Business, and I want you to know we run the ROIs on this, and, uh, and it's actually a great investment, Gary, so uh, you. You, you do a great job for us, so thank you. Uh, Gary brings uh, to his role as moderator of today's uh, business conference a wealth of journalistic, media, and business experience and a demonstrated ability to get to the facts. Uh, we're most fortunate that Gary has graciously accepted our invitation to participate today and uh, it's going to be an awesome conference. So without further ado, let's tee it up. Gary, thank you. Dan, thank you very much for that kind introduction and that uh, unexpected plug. Um, I, I will tell you the Kelly School was the very first sponsor of our program some 13 years ago uh, and remains so today and I'm very proud of that fact uh, indeed. So Dan, thank you and for, um, for your leadership too uh, at the Kelly School. Well, good morning everyone. I uh, am honored to be here today. I've attended this event for many, many years uh, and, and uh, have enjoyed it uh, each and every year, learned something every year, so um, and always see a lot of great people here uh, as well from around the state, so when I had uh, was uh, offered the opportunity to be here, I jumped at it because this truly is a special event. I think you're going to find the event um, today to be very relevant. Um, we hope you find the perspectives and the conversation, the discussion to be stimulating, and importantly, something that you can take away uh, from today uh, to benefit you uh, in your business and professional endeavors. Certainly, the theme of this year's uh, conference is topical. Few issues have been uh, more hotly debated around the country, or for that matter, around the coffee table, than the, uh, the role of government intervention in a market-based economy, and today we will rethink the relationship between uh, government uh, and business, and we'll do it with the help of uh, really some extraordinary business executives and thought leaders. Great, great group of folks this year again. Uh, so we'll have a, uh, a great discussion uh, throughout the morning, and we'll begin, great way to start, I think, with a brief uh, point-counterpoint between two distinguished members of the Kelly faculty. That will be followed by prepared remarks from our four uh, distingu uh, distinguished executives. We'll then take a short break uh, and then jump into a robust dialogue uh, between our four executive speakers with audience participation. And Dan and uh, Stephen alluded to this uh, earlier. We want to make this an interactive uh, experience and trying some new things this, this year, which I think will make the, uh, the conference and the event uh, very worthwhile indeed. So we want this to be a very uh, interactive experience as we further explore the topics uh, at hand. So. Let's get started with, uh, with the day, and we, uh, we kick it off, tee up the, uh, the issues uh, of the day in a great way, I think, with a, uh, I've got my wireless on, so I think hopefully you can still hear me as I uh, move over. John, how are you? Good. Nice. Good to see you, Bruce. Nice to see you. Good to see you. I'm going to start off with a, uh, a little point-counterpoint uh, session on the topic of the day, uh, the government-business relationship. Very fortunate to have two very distinguished and well-known members of the Kelly, uh, Kelly faculty to join us for this uh, conversation. John Boquist is the uh, Edward E. Edwards Professor of Finance in the Kelly School. John is widely acknowledged uh, an expert in the fields of corporate finance, financial strategy and analysis, banking and investment as well. He's a, a, a long line of Kelly graduates, including Derek Rice, has uh, <laughs> certainly uh, learned their craft from Professor Boquist. On my left uh, is uh, Bruce, Bruce Jaffe. Like John, uh, uh, Bruce, an emeritus professor of business economics and public policy, has a long and distinguished uh, record at the Kelly School and at Indiana University um, as well. Bruce's particular areas of expertise center on economic development, industry regulation, taxation, and energy policy. He's also director of Indiana University Center for International Business Education and Research. So with those uh, Brief introductions. John, you are up first. I get to go first. Yep. Well, good morning. Uh, I have to start by saying I'm an unabashed supporter of free market capitalism. Uh, I do believe social harmony does come through the pursuit of self-interest in the long run. 
and uh, surely the premise is based on individual rights. Uh, in truly free markets, I think government intervention uh, should be limited to just a few areas, uh, most notably to uh, regulate against the force and fraud, if you look at the uh, history of the thought on capitalism, uh, naturally police, defense, uh, uh, legal structures, and so on, uh, will protect us from that. Uh, I do think we really have a mixed economy now, and probably will have for the long future, so I, I do think there's government uh, support for certain activities and free enterprise on the other, uh, so you don't want to draw too sharp of a difference. Uh, I do think it, it is an adaptive system. So what seems to be happening is a, uh, a crisis hits, and I guess that's when we get around to doing stuff in the U.S., mm -hmm. and the meter goes from uh, uh, <clears throat> this side to that side. And I think if you look at uh, what some people call the Reagan Revolution, I think we put the meter over towards the free enterprise, uh, free market side. Now a crisis hits, and we're running that meter over to the government intervention side. I think we've got to be very careful as we, uh, as we look at the response to these uh, problems uh, because we have to balance, I think, the interests of the state and free enterprise. And I think we have to recognize uh, the fallibility of both. I, I don't think any system is, is perfect, and we have to achieve those checks and balances, I think, in the system. Uh, certainly there's plenty of blame to go around, and uh, no need to review all of that for the so-called Great Recession we just experienced. Uh, uh, I know the economists have told us it's over, but it doesn't quite feel like it for most of us, I guess. Um, uh, certainly this all came to a head, uh, no doubt, in the financial markets. And in the financial markets, I think we do have a, 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 an interesting issue on regulation. It, it, if you look at a history of, of banks, I think banks uh, typically have been the primary source of, of credit. Uh, and what changed sort of in the 1970s was we moved away from banks being the primary source to the capital markets. And the capital markets is more uh, uh, freely traded assets, uh, very efficient, but I don't think necessarily the regulatory structure was, uh, was good enough to protect us from uh, what ultimately happened. I think the bank regulation uh, to some extent was flawed. Uh, we wound up with very large institutions, and you couple that with deposit insurance provided by the government, and I think there was an, an incredible incentive perhaps to take too much risk. That plus the fact that you could easily uh, sell securities in the market, capital markets, uh, led to some uh, obviously severe issues. Uh, bank regulation used to be bank regulators going to the bank looking at the underwriting of individual loans. And the decision was, as capital markets grew, let's look at rating agencies as a substitute for that investigation of the individual loans. And at the end of the day, I think what happened is we had much, uh, much too much reliance on, uh, on, on using a rating system to determine how much capital was needed. And we all know the ratings were flawed. A AAA uh, collateralized debt obligation really wasn't a AAA uh, 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 security. So regulation was there. I think in some sense the regulation was flawed, and we've got to fix that. Uh, I, I like to think of this as the 3D world. Uh, Hollywood's gone 3D, and I suppose I've gone 3D. What are the Ds? Debt, deficits, and dysfunctional government. And I think that's what we have right now. Uh, clearly, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have all our legislators uh, living in Illinois now. Uh, I guess the hospitality industry in Illinois is doing well with Wisconsin and uh, Indiana reps hanging out there for a long time. Uh, we do have a tsunami of debt. Uh, we have 14.3 trillion in uh, U.S. debt. We have an extra 5 trillion for backing uh, the mortgage market in Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. And depending on who you believe in the growth, anywhere from 50 to 100 trillion in entitlement requirements, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And, and this is just too much debt. Uh, don't forget what a trillion is. If you invest a, a million dollars a day for 365 days a year, a trillion dollars is 2,740 years. That's what we're leaving for our young generation, thank you students, uh, <laughs> to pay off. The deficit, we're running a deficit last year of 1.6 trillion. 
Uh, it used to be a billion was a big number, now it's a trillion. Put that in perspective, that's the deficit. No other country in the world has a total budget of 1.6 trillion. Uh, the states are in trouble now, uh, now that stimulus is ending, and the prediction is there's 130 billion in uh, shortfall at the state level. Dysfunctional government, the last D. Uh, we have a problem. Uh, it, it certainly seems to be that uh, I think rational heads will prevail, but we must seek this balance that we're looking for. Uh, the regulation, I think, has swung far this way. Makes sense to clean up some of the, the cowboy trading and derivatives, but the problem is, is one size does not fit all. A lot of companies, I'm sure some up here, trade derivatives for hedging purposes on their uh, raw materials. And so you come down in the financial industry and you run the risk in the, uh, in the, in the productive industry. Uh, when it's all said and done, we need these checks and balances to balance private incentives uh, with public interests. And, and when it's all said and done, we have to realize we have a global market and regulation is, nas is national. And you run the risk of having national regulations that don't fit the global market, which means we may lose our competitiveness and, uh, and have a problem. Uh, economists have studied the amount of debt we have and in general, once you hit 90% of GDP is debt, your growth slows. It costs you about 1.3% in growth rates. Uh, this year, the U.S. hit 96% of GDP, gross domestic product, in debt. So we've got a severe problem. What will happen? I think we're going to have to adjust our spending and raise taxes. At the end of the day, we need a balance of the two, otherwise this is going to come back and crush us. And uh, at the end of the day, we want to make sure we don't hinder the growth prospects of business because we're going to have to grow those tax revenues in order to dig out of this hole. Thank you very much. All right. Great job. Thank you, John. <laughs> Bruce, what say you? Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. As I listened to John's comments, um, there are a few things that I agree with, which is kind of interesting. I, I, <laughs> I like uh, some of the details, uh, but I guess my view on the basic premise is pretty different in terms of how much we can rely on the free market, private capitalism uh, system. Like John, I guess I view the pendulum, he used the word meter, but the pendulum of finding the appropriate balance uh, between government involvement in the marketplace and reliance on the forces of the free market. Uh, that has swung, I think, recently too far to the right, and there's no question, certainly, we have a uh, dysfunctional uh, government si situation at the state and the federal levels at this point. Um, I think, uh, at the extreme, regulation is being viewed as inherently bad by definition, just like higher taxes, which John said a few seconds ago, uh, and I saw the blood pressure meter that you're all attached to go up <laughs> real high. And because that, that's a, the, really the kiss of death, higher taxes to politicians, which I view as basically irresponsible. But the idea that regulation is inherently bad, I view as equally uh, dysfunctional in that way. I guess I'll maintain that there is an appropriate uh, role for regulation and general government involvement throughout the economy. And we should take a broad view and understand the way in which the government uh, is involved uh, in, in our day-to-day -day activities as consumers and as business people. That's not to say that there shouldn't be a re-examination periodically um, of the benefits and costs of regulation. Sunset on certain rules, I think that would be desirable. And changes in regulatory mechanisms uh, so that we can have incentive regulation that's in the right direction and certainly smart uh, regulation. Uh, my major premise is that we had major and appropriate uh, industry re deregulation in the 1980s and 1970s, going back to the Reagan uh, revolution, especially in transportation. It's hard to believe way back, but we used to have uh, prices set by the government for airlines and trucking and controls on entry into those markets. Uh, certainly communication is another area where I think deregulation was uh, very successful. Uh, the old AT&T, if, if uh, many of us can remember back to the 1970s, uh, one monopoly provider of probably 19th century technology uh, at that time. Uh, 
and there have been, of course, areas where there have been significant technological uh, innovations and regulations certainly ought to get out of the way when there are changes. Uh, however, I think we have, after the, this uh, great recession, uh, sort of forgotten how the failures of the free market, the ways in which regulation could be approved and now improved, and now the focus is on let's get less government, less government, rely more on the free market. And let me talk about a number of points broadly defined in terms of why we ought to regulate, and I've essentially put down like seven uh, specific areas. Um, one is we need regulation to deal with markets that are inherently monopolistic to mainly the traditional public utilities like uh, natural gas or electricity and, and avoid duplication at one extreme or high prices that we have a monopolist in the market at the other extreme. Uh, especially when there aren't any counteracting benefits in terms of innovation or service competition. Secondly, I think we need through the antitrust authorities and government involvement there uh, to promote competition by preventing and reducing market power in various areas. And as we look at mergers and acquisitions, sometimes they're driven by efficiency, <coughs> excuse me, but often by ways to get more market power. Uh, thirdly, I think we, and we stress, we need regulation to control areas in which uh, there are or potentially are what economists describe as negative uh, externalities, especially in the environmental aspect and health and safety. Uh, fourth is areas where we can lower information costs. Truth in lending, all our uh, daily requests for credit cards, just as yet another credit card, the issue indicating the terms being explicit and consistent is certainly an example of that. Uh, standards for medical providers in terms of licensing, food safety, product labeling are other examples where information costs are a very positive part, I view, in principle, in terms of regulation. Uh, safety and soundness uh, uh, standards, uh, certainly we had a lot of uh, uh, issues in financial markets, a lot of bank failures, but the system, unlike the 1930s and the Great Depression and other in situations in other countries, the banking system did not collapse to a great extent because of deposit insurance and, I'd argue, effective uh, regulation. I also can see that we use regulation, maybe too much, maybe in some cases not enough, to achieve social objectives. And it can be as innocuous, I guess, and generally as widely received in uh, 2011 in things like mandatory education, control of uh, alcohol sales, something that's certainly <laughs> real popular among students, uh, gambling, <laughs> casinos, alternative energy, uh, promotion, uh, mileage standards, I mean, those are all there to achieve various kinds of social objectives. And then finally, regulation that gets into labor markets that deal with non-discrimination. It's hard to realize that not so long ago, we didn't have standards that prevented discrimination in labor markets in terms of issues like uh, sex, race, national, or, uh, um, national origin, or sexual orientation. Um, there's no question that I think we ought to understand that regulation does and can affect uh, some economic interests in a different way or at the expense of others. And it's important to identify the gainers and the losers. Um, but only, only then can individuals properly make the decision of what form of regulation should we do and do the benefits exceed the costs. To have a general answer that says government will solve our problems or government is the problem is, is just basically uh, uh, let's ignore the facts and uh, uh, just come to a, a knee-jerk reaction. Um, I, I agree, as John does, that we're in a now intertwined international market. We've got to look at regulation and free market implications for that uh, decision on the world as well as our nation as a whole. And I think the issue is let's make decisions that involve the meter or the pendulum somewhere in the middle and let's base decisions not on uh, slogans, but base decisions based on data and identification of alternatives and who are the gainers and who are the losers. Yeah, great perspective. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, John, you brought up taxes. I did. And the need <laughs> for taxes uh, in certain instances to be, to be raised. Let's look to our West. 
where uh, some Indiana legislators are continue to be holed up. Um, uh, they raised taxes in a big way. Uh, huge increase in the corporate yeah. income tax uh, a few months ago. That has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, the governor and others in Illinois look at it as doing the right thing. A lot of other people don't. What, what's, your, what's your opinion? Well, I think you've you got to separate the issue because I think there's two things to worry about. I think people often talk about the tax rate, if that's the most important thing. But I think it's really more important to look at the total tax dollars raised. And at the end of the day, what we should be doing is promoting growth in the economy, which would allow you to leave the rates roughly the same and generate more tax revenue. So when I say we're going to increase taxes, I'm talking about the total tax revenue. Which, which could be done if we can get some growth. The, the problem we've got is if we have regulations and an international incompetitiveness that hurts our growth, uh, regardless of what the rates mm -hmm. you put on, we'll just make it worse and we won't collect the revenues that we need. So I, I always look at taxes of total revenue raised and paradoxically, sometimes you lower the rate, capital gains I think being a good choice and actually the total revenue goes up. Bruce? I'd add to that that I mean, we've also got to look at, we're raising taxes, how is the money being spent and where's the impact? I mean, some of the high tax states that we have, or for that matter, worldwide, some of the high tax countries in the world spend money wisely, spend money effectively. I mean, if you're looking for low cost <coughs> states, maybe look at the southeast. Is there a lot to say from Louisiana, <laughs> Mississippi, Alabama? I mean, some of the high-cost states are states where it's great to, to live, uh, places like, uh, not, I'm not going to pick on Indiana or Illinois, they, uh, <laughs> but let's look at uh, places like Minnesota, Wisconsin. I mean, the tragedy to me view in California is not high taxes or low taxes as much as they are destroying the fantastic, say, educational system and, uh, candidly, the pretty desirable uh, social services that they have in California without looking at the consequences and alternatives. Mm -hmm. You talked about regulation, um, and uh, you know John mentioned the risk of overregulation and stifling innovation, which is one of the key questions uh, at, you know, at the at the conference today. I think, what's your take on that, Bruce? How concerned are you that now or going forward, innovation is being stifled if you go up to? You know, Warsaw and talk to the device people up in the orthopedic industry or maybe the folks in the pharmaceutical industry as well. I mean, there's real concern about innovation and about regulation and government innovation stifling that. I think there's no question. I mean, you, you can't make a case that regulation encourages, unless there's subsidies there, really encourages innovation. Clearly, when you talk about regulation, that in effect is a subsidy and may encourage innovation, say, an alternative energy, our, you know, our the wind farms in northern Indiana uh, would not be there but for various kinds of regulations or tax subsidies. But basically, if you go into various markets, regulation probably maintains the status quo and not great innovations. But, um, you know, it's kind of hard to argue against innovation, but the question is also controlling risks. And in terms, I'm sure our, our major speakers today will elaborate on this, but when you start talking about medical devices, pharmaceuticals, yes, regulation controls and limits innovation, but it is designed not to do that. It's designed to avoid the risks on health and safety there. So the question is really two things. What's the balance between slowing down the rate of innovation, which regulation will do, versus avoiding some of the risks there? And then secondly is the question of let's periodically, I think this is one issue where I think uh, regulation of regulators and, and government officials, legislators have failed, is to let's periodically, automatically look at the impact, the benefits and costs of the regulation, maybe every five years, and then reconsider whether or not we need regulation or we have the right regulatory mechanism. If I could just add to that, uh, Jerry, one of the things I mentioned was global markets and national regulation. And I think what's, what's frustrating to many business people is where you have Europe approves a, uh, a pharmaceutical product and it's not approved in the U.S. and vice versa. And I think at the end of the day, we all have to compete in the global markets. And so the national regulation in some sense gets in the way of innovation because you can't uh, adapt your products around. And so it's very frustrating to have 
one body say okay and the other say no. And I, and I think that's a very frustrating part of the innovation. Quick uh, final comment from each of you uh, is where we go from here. I think it was uh, last week there was a, a congressman from North Carolina who boldly stated the era of, of government inter intervention is over. Um, yet, uh, you know, maybe a little political uh, uh, hype, but, um, but then we're talking about, you know, bailout for the Postal Service, bailout for the states, you know, the you know, continuing talk of government intervention in, in a variety of areas. Where does it go from Well, I, I, I do think as, I'll jump on the pendulum bed when I can get away from the meter, I think it has swung, <laughs> it has swung more to the, uh, to the intervention side. Uh, we've got to be careful, and, and really at the end of the day, I think the problem is, is clear. We've got... Uh, we've got people shouting on both sides of the aisle, and, and we need people to get in the middle here and make sure we aren't, don't uh, kill the golden goose, if you will, because mm -hmm. it is business that's the engine of economic growth in the country, and I think government is there to help encourage that, and I agree with Bruce, make sure we're doing things safely and in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a spirit of democracy and equality. Uh, but we've got to be very, very careful. I, I think what's going to happen is the government's going to take uh, more responsibility, but I do believe the government's going to get smaller. Uh, I think this debate going on now at the state legislature is I think people are finally realizing, although people have been shouting this for years, that these entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare, will gobble up the entire budget uh, depending on your prediction in, 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 if we don't get the growth in 2050, 2040. So we finally have to start looking at expenditures in these areas and certainly education is there as well. So, so I think we're going to have the, the problem is the government is out of bullets because of the debt being so high and we're going to have to get this back in balance. That, that's my prediction. Final word uh, for you, Bruce. Yeah, I mean, I think early on, uh, to test the meters, we put the, uh, the question is, too big to fail up on the screen. And I think that's got a great theme and a great discussion for, for today and this morning. Uh, clearly, I mean, just look back just a few years, the government, whatever that means, let Lehman Brothers fail. And the consequences of that worldwide were really pretty enormous. And there were a lot of other people, so let, them all, let the whole thing, let Merrill Lynch fail, let everybody else fail. And I think the consequences of that would have been enormous. I think John's right, certainly government's going to get smaller. To a great extent, government has to get smaller because we spent so much in the last few years trying to dig us out of a big hole. The billions, trillions, for that matter, that were spent in the last few years has been successful at getting us out of, uh, to avoiding the Great Recession II of the 21st century. Um, we were really in deep trouble worldwide, and I think the spending was useful but a, uh, to get us out of there, but it was not part of a really coherent plan of taxes, there weren't any taxes, and spending. And I hope in the next five years, with both sides, we will have sort of smarter spending and uh, possibly higher taxes, but smarter focus on benefits and costs of uh, spending and regulation. All right. Bruce Jaffe, John Boquist. How about a big round of applause for two great guys? Thank, thank you, John, very much. Bruce, thank very you. Good. Thank you. The first chief executive uh, I will introduce heads a company that is based in New York but is, uh, is clearly uh, making um, headlines and making uh, some great success stories around the globe, including here in Indiana with a major president, uh, presence, both, both in terms of investment uh, and jobs. That company uh, is, uh, again, on the national stage uh, doing great things. Let's learn a little bit more in this video. Two years after the worst recession most of us have ever known, the economy is growing again. A single generation, revolutions in technology have transformed the way we live, work, and do business. We need to get behind this innovation. We need to out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build the rest of the world. That's the project the American people want us to work on, together. Today is a very special day for all of us. Thanks to your efforts and hard work, Enter One is being recognized 
for having become an innovative company and a company that's creating jobs at a time when our country desperately needs this. Ladies and gentlemen, my fellow co-workers of Inner One, I am very proud to introduce to you our guest, my new friend, Vice President Joe Biden. As the President pointed out last night, once America has set a goal, we have never, 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 never not achieved that goal. A year and a half ago, this administration made a judgment. We decided it's not sufficient to create new jobs. We have to create whole new industries. The future starts off with battery-operated automobiles or partially battery-operated automobiles. Why should they be made anywhere else than in America? This facility here, the federal government came up with X millions of dollars. But guess what? These guys went out and raised double the amount of money, 155 million. These batteries, you get 100 miles on a charge, three bucks of clean energy, as opposed to having to spend 20 to 30 bucks to go the same distance on imported oil. We're back in the game. We start in the race of the 21st century in an incredibly strong position relative to the rest of the world. But this is about you all. This is about what you're doing. It's about what you are accomplishing. Look around, y'all. It's a big facility, partially used, but it's going to grow. Start off with 80, you're going to be 1,000 people working in this facility. When Thomas Edison first demonstrated his incandescent light bulb, he proudly proclaimed that we shall make electricity so cheap that only the rich will be able to afford candles. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here at Enter One, we're going to harness electricity and bring it to the world like Edison did more than a century ago. We're going to reshape the way Americans drive, the way Americans power their lives, and in turn, we're going to reshape America itself. And we're going to get there where it literally is more expensive to put petroleum in your vehicle than it is to run an alternative power. And you're the start. You know how good you are. With more research and incentives, we can become the first country to have a million electric vehicles on the road by 2050. We do big things. The idea of America endures. Our destiny remains our choice. I guess fired up for our first speaker here. Charles Gassenheimer is CEO and chairman of Inner One. Inner One is uh, truly spearheading the national movement toward domestic high performance battery production. It's Greenfield. Indiana facility, which is where Vice President uh, Biden was in that video just east of Indianapolis, is uh, the only commercial scale manufacturer of automotive grade lithium ion battery systems in the entire United States. Charles is also chairman of Think uh, Incorporated, the world's uh, leading dedicated electric vehicle maker whose Elkhart, Indiana plant, northern Indiana, is uh, already producing but uh, slated to begin full production in July of this year. Please welcome Charles Gassenheimer. Good morning, and uh, in case there are any questions about government involvement in business, uh, I think uh, you understand where I stand. <laughs> any questions? <laughs> it, is a, uh, it is a great honor for me to be here today. Um, when I started uh, at Enter One in uh, January of 2006, we had uh, 20 employees in the state of Indiana, uh, actually 20 employees total. Uh, we now have 800 employees globally today, including 358 employees in Indiana, and I'm pleased to uh, announce that uh, over 30 of those are IU grads, so uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm here today to represent uh, IU, which I think is a tremendous program, uh, and um, <clears throat> rather than uh, go through and answer the five questions that were posed to each of us today, uh, what I thought I would do uh, is give you some perspective, mainly because I feel like I'm closer to the students um, than my colleagues, I'm only uh, 37. And therefore, when the two professors started speaking, I, I actually almost took out my pen to start taking notes. So I, 
uh, I guess this. So let me weave for you uh, a little bit of my personal journey, um, because I think uh, my personal journey is intriguing uh, relative to the five questions that have been posed to us today. Uh, I started my career after uh, I did go to an uh, undergraduate business program. I, I didn't go to IU, unfortunately. I went to a school in Philadelphia. But uh, I, I did apply to IU. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> let's just say uh, Philadelphia was, the, the, was my calling, my choosing. But, um, but I, uh, I started my career in a, a wonderful field called distressed bond trading. And uh, one of the things I think that's always interesting as you think about the world of distressed is A, uh, it's usually a four-letter word that you use when you describe these distressed people. And let's just say in mixed company, I'll, I'll, I'll say I won't use that word, but uh, vulture investing, uh, bottom feeders. And uh, one of the things I always find very interesting uh, as I think about uh, my career in um, deep value investing um, was that we're taught, okay, that when you own a bond, the best thing that could possibly ever happen to you is you get paid back your principal. This is the best thing. It's not an equity bet. You're loaning people money. You're trusting people with your money. You get some coupon. That coupon is your discount rate based on the cost of capital. And the best thing that could ever happen is par. And as I think about my career and as I think about being involved as an equity partner in an $8 billion hedge fund at the ripe old age of 29 and saying, well, how did this happen? I said to myself that <clears throat> there were a few things that became clear to me. One, I am an expert in structured products, especially derivatives. Two, as I thought about derivatives and the products I was trading, and I would ask myself, I don't know, I'm a pretty smart guy, maybe. <laughs> But I'm having trouble understanding what this product is. And I ask myself, if I'm having trouble understanding what this product is, and I actually am supposed to be an expert in it, okay, how about the person on the other end of the phone? Do you think they know what that is? And how about the person on the other end of the phone that they're talking to who's buying the risk that I'm off taking? And I got to a point uh, in my career, in 2005 in particular, where credit derivatives, or CDS, uh, and uh, CDOs, credit default swaps, credit default obligations, bundling, packaging, all of these first and second derivative products of the cash product, the bond itself. And uh, I got to a point where I started to ask myself, well, geez, how much of this product actually exists? And uh, so I called up my friendly bond salesman at J.P. Morgan Chase, who was the king of this industry at the time, and I said, well, guys, how much of this CDS product you have outstanding today. He said, oh, about 65 trillion. I'm like, okay, that seems like a big number. We were hearing about what one trillion is, is 2,700 years. And I'm like, okay, you'd have to go back to the age of the dinosaurs to probably uh, figure out how long it would take to manage that risk. I said, well, how do you manage the risk for this? Oh, well, we have, a, we have a, an Excel model. I said, okay. <laughs> I said, how many workbooks do you have? <laughs> And that's when it dawned on me that in 2005, we didn't understand any of the risks we were taking. And it comes back to, if you think about the recession, how we got here, there's a couple of things that I would share with you based on my experiences. First thing I would say is it starts with the loan officer, okay? If you're a banking loan officer and you're meeting with you, the individual who wants to borrow money, the first thing you have to be thinking to yourself is, how do I protect my company? I'm loaning someone money. I'm expecting them to pay me back some small rate of interest, five, six, seven percent. It's not a lot of money. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty cheap coupon for cheap debt on a house. And yet, there's a level of trust that has to come where I have to protect the bank. And I think that's where the first failure stopped is that loan officers, for whatever reasons, whether it's Ulte, whether it's stated income mortgages, whether it's Fannie and Freddie that permitted these mortgages where you literally didn't even have to provide any documentation supporting what your income was. They're called stated income mortgages. That means that I could come in and tell you I make a hundred grand and oh by the way I don't have a job but I make a hundred grand and I can get a mortgage on a house. That's step one of where our failure started on this little journey of ours. Step two was as this snowballed 
the Wall Street engine kicked in. This big white snowball started rolling down the mountain. And once the Wall Street engine kicks in, you're toast. I mean, you know, Goldman Sachs is just way too good at marketing. And uh, the fascinating thing to me as I watched this unfold was that Goldman, who is, uh, you know, arguably the premier name, not only did they, could they not buy enough product from the banks to sell to their largest single customer in the world, AIG, but they had to do something even more dramatic. They said, we can't get enough of this subprime Ulte crap. So we're going to do something even more revolutionary. We're going to create a new product called a synthetic CDO. What the heck is that? Yeah? It's, a, it's a derivative of a derivative, a synthetic CDO. We're now talking about a second derivative instrument. And AIG, who's trusting us, trusting the rating agencies, AIG is basically sitting there going, OK, we'll buy 50, 100 billion of this because it's AAA credit, right? And Goldman Sachs is plowing this stuff into their largest single customer in the world. So again, that's where the second, let's say, breakdown happened of how we got to, to where we are in this little journey. The third breakdown, of course, is the rating agencies and then the government. When does the government step in and regulate? When does the government have to step in and, and pull the safety valve? And of course, by accepting these uh, mortgages into the Fannie and Freddie, Freddie credit pools, the government break down. So that's a quick version, a very quick version of how we got here. And, and as I said before, I didn't want to spend too much time on that. But I think that you understand, I get asked questions a lot of, well, how did I become the CEO and chairman of an alternative energy company? And I think on my little journey, I became disenfranchised after 11, 12 years on Wall Street in the ripe old age of 32, I became disenfranchised about what I was doing every day. And I personally felt that we as responsible individuals on Wall Street were not doing what we were there to do. There is a level of assurance, there's a level of trust that comes with being self-regulated as an industry. And once you lose that trust as a self-regulated organization, that's when the wheels came off the the train, and, and, and while I obviously uh, in 2005 didn't know how the story would end uh, and certainly didn't expect it to end as badly as it did, uh, I can tell you that one of the interesting things is when I did join Enter One as its chairman in January of 2006, I left an equity partnership in an $8 billion hedge fund, and, and much to the chagrin of my peers who thought I was completely out of my mind, and maybe I was, less than two and a half years later, that hedge fund would no longer exist. It went bankrupt. And that gives you some idea of the scale and scope of that massive avalanche snowball that came down the hill and just rolled everybody out the door. So coming to Enter One and coming to innovation, coming to why I think that government needs to be involved in innovation. As you think about our industry and as you think about how much needs to be done here in America, I think one of the things that, that is clear to me is that we've talked about some of the numbers. I like numbers and I love data, but the numbers are where we are today and not where we're going. And I would ask you to think about the following data. We, we use 18 million barrels of oil a day in the United States to power our big economy, largest economy in the world by a factor of five. China has a middle class of 350 million people and growing. Their middle class is bigger than the entire population of the United States. And yet here we are at 18 million barrels of oil per day, and the price of oil has gone up $10. Why? Because some crazy strong man in the Middle East who we don't know, well, we sort of know, has decided that he wants to kill his citizens, okay? So we're sitting on $100 oil. Where is it going? We don't know. But what I can tell you is, is that that extra $10 of oil, uh, based on some arbitrary event that's completely outside of our control, is now costing the U.S. economy $65.7 billion per day extra. 65, that's one day. Okay? Multiply that by 365 days. And now let's talk about oil going to 120 or 140, and let's talk about China and how much oil they need. And now you're talking about numbers where if I were to say to you as a risk manager that this administration decided to put $2 billion into clean technology, lithium ion batteries to power new electric cars, $2 billion versus a potential trillion dollar per year risk of the price of oil going up to 120 or 140, sounds like a pretty good bet to me. 
So I ask you to think about in terms of that. The second thing I ask you to think about as we get into our uh, deb debate later today is as we think about energy, the one thing that the U.S. does a very poor job of is looking into the future. Uh, if each of you, and hopefully each of you will be, have the opportunity to run a business someday and you look down into the loving eyes of your boards of directors and they say, well, where's your business plan? Where's your business plan? Business plan isn't a quarter. It's not a 12-month process. It's a five to 10-year process. Where is America's business plan for energy? It is the largest single industry we have in the United States. The last election, all we heard was alternative energy versus drill baby drill. Well, neither of them were a very good energy policy, to be perfectly blunt. We need everything. We need wind, we need solar, we need coal, we need nuclear. We need all of these things that will help us to reduce the overall cost of powering our economy, the largest economy in the world. And so I ask you to think about that in terms of an energy policy. Why am I so passionate about the company that I've been charged with fiduciarily? Why am I so passionate about growing this company and, and being a spokesperson for our industry in both Washington and around the world? Because I know I've got the right answer. I know we have to electrify transportation. It is the only answer. I fully am aware of that. Yet Japan, over the last 20 years, has spent $100 billion as a government on standing up the lithium-ion battery industry, precursor materials, cells, modules, battery packs. Japan has invested $100 billion. That's why they're number one in this industry. The US has invested less than $50 billion in this industry. So if you want to understand why we're not number one in this industry, that's the answer. China has opened up their checkbook. And when China wants to do something, they don't go ask Congress. They just write a check. China's decided they want to be the number one in, number one in the world in electric vehicles. I think that's an admirable goal. But the difference is they've just opened up their checkbook, and they're going to spend $100 billion on electric buses over the next 10 years. And the Chinese government has announced that they will not have a single bus, truck, or any other vehicle fleet that has an internal combustion engine in 10 years from now. Now, that's a hell of a goal. That's a $100 billion opportunity for Enter one So there's a real business opportunity here. But they're going to back that with everything they've got. We don't have that level of commitment here yet. So that's the third thing I'd ask you to think about as we get into our debate. I really do appreciate the chance to be here today. I think that one of the things that I really do focus on when we look at the role of government in business is the following. There is no doubt in my mind that there is a role for government in business, whether it be as the backstop, as the regulator, as the cop. There has to be. That is the role of government. But I also agree, uh, even though I don't agree with everything the current administration does, I also agree that the government has to be there to help with innovation, to help with seed capital, to help put us on the path to rapid growth and rapid expansion, because when we listen to the debate that rages both here, outside these walls, in front of the state houses around this country, in front of the Capitol building in the US, the one thing I can tell you for sure, being an economist myself, is that if we don't expand this economy, if we don't use technology to expand and get to that next level, I don't think we can raise taxes high enough to be able to service our debt. We have to grow this economy. We have to bring jobs back to this economy. And innovation is at the core of what we have to do, in my opinion. I look forward to debating it later. Thank you. Charles, thank you very much. Well, our next speaker, David Hoover, is a Kelly alum and he is also chairman of Ball Corporation and its uh, immediate past president and chief executive officer. Uh, during his just completed 10 years as Ball Corporation CEO and president, uh, David is credited with achieving a 500%, 500% return to shareholders, growing the company to some $8 billion in sales in 2010. Please welcome David Hoover. Well, good morning, everyone. I uh, just met Charles up here, and uh, 
I too would like to greet the students in the audience and uh, tell you, Charles, that youth is overrated to some degree. So. <laughs> I feel like I'm being picked on in here a little bit, but at any rate, no, it's, uh, it is great to be here. And, and uh, I, uh, I am reminded, as uh, I made that earlier comment, of a logo I saw in a t-shirt one time uh, that uh, the older I get, the better I was. I don't know if you've, uh, if you've seen that, but uh, try to keep that in mind. I think the first IU business conference I went to was in 1970, so uh, I've been to a few. Not everyone, but a few. And uh, that one was held on the uh, IU campus. Uh, it was a good meeting then, but uh, better attendance, and this is a great opportunity to be here and to share some thoughts with, with all of you. And uh, just before addressing today's topic, uh, I thought I'd tell you a little about Ball Corporation uh, to enable you maybe to participate or to appreciate the uh, perspective that I have. Uh, our company's 131 years old this year. Uh, we are incorporated in Indiana. We were headquartered in Muncie, Indiana until 1998 when we relocated to Broomfield, Colorado. That's about halfway between Denver and Boulder. Uh, we made that move because we had exited the glass container business, something we were in for over a, a century uh, by 1996, and we had a couple hundred people in a, a corporate office building in Muncie and about 3,000 in Colorado. So it just made sense to do that. Uh, many of us continue to have associations here in Indiana, and we have, uh, we have a great beverage can plant up in Monticello where we're making uh, a new product for us, uh, an Alumatec bottle. This, uh, this has a large opening end. I imagine there are people uh, here in the audience that are familiar with this container. It does contain uh, Miller Lite and Coors Light beer. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we're, we're, uh, we're pleased to be doing that. We, uh, we really appreciate in our company the, uh, what I would describe as strong Midwestern values uh, and, and really the positive impact that, uh, that these values and, and, and really that the, uh, the Ball family had on and, and continues to have on our company. Today, we're a manufacturing company. In 1998, our, our sales, uh, Gary men Jerry mentioned this, uh, were uh, not quite $3 billion. This year, analysts think we're going to do $8.5 billion. Uh, we operate in 14 countries, including 20 facilities across Europe, seven in, in Asia, five in Brazil and Argentina, and in North America we operate uh, 42 facilities in 20 states and two Canadian provinces. In the interim, we've grown both by acquisition and organically. We've become increasingly international. Today about a third of our sales uh, are uh, outside the United States. Uh, that part of our business grows faster, uh, clearly, than, than we do in the U.S. So, you know, becoming more a global company. Our primary products, maybe not exciting, although the, the beer containers may be, um, are metal containers for beverages, food, and household products. Our oldest business, however, is, uh, is our Ball Aerospace and Technologies Corporation. It got started in, in Boulder, Colorado in 1956. It accounts for about 10 percent of our sales. and. Uh, it accounts for nearly 20%, though, of, of our worldwide employment of about 14,500 people. The aerospace business, uh, uh, one of the things that, just to give you an idea of what it does, uh, it, uh, it has built all the, uh, all the instruments for the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, in 1998, our market cap was a billion four, and it's about six and a half billion dollars today. So we've grown and prospered during that period. And if you'd like to know more about it, I know this is a great ball commercial, and I'm good at that, uh, more about our company, you can get to us at www.ball.com. But I want to turn to today's conference topic, and certainly I'd agree with the uh, comments that have been made. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's necessary and important that there is a relationship between business and government. And uh, <coughs> certainly we have that. It, it seems like... Uh, it isn't just a relationship, it's many relationships, and at times I feel like it's too many relationships. Uh, there is a logical role for government. I won't dwell on that. I think it's been well stated uh, to do those things like enforcing law and, and, and so forth that, that have to be done and to regulate up to a point. Uh, like others who've spoken before me, however, I think uh, whether it's meters or pendulums or, or however you want to measure it, uh, 
maybe that regulating pendulum has swung too far in the direction of regulation. I was pleased to hear our president recently, I know you actually wrote a, a, uh, an op-ed in the journal one day, the Wall Street Journal, talking about uh, the fact that we need to really look at regulation. Uh, I think there was an article again a day or two ago in the Wall Street Journal that pointed out there are many situations where we've got not just one group looking at a point or, or something that's going on, but more than one. And at times, uh, it must, it feels like over the last, particularly the last decade or so, starting with Sarbanes-Oxley and some of the other things, certainly there were good things that came out of them. But uh, often, uh, you know, it's very frustrating to feel uh, all we do is fill out forms or answer questions or uh, do things that, that uh, so I'm getting a little frustrated here. I, I had occasion to look back at a ball proxy statement from the mid-90s um, within the last uh, month, and it was 18 pages long. You know, um, it's longer than that now. Our 10K is well over 100 pages, and I defy most of the smart people in the audience to understand what it's saying. So anyway, I'll get off that kick a little bit. But um, I, I just uh, feel that we've got to be more rational about some of this. Uh, to really uh, to address more specifically on today's conference topic, I want to uh, make some positive statements. I'm going to draw heavily on, uh, on a strategy that uh, the uh, National Association of Manufacturers uh, is promulgated and, and uh, that certainly uh, I agree with. We're a longtime member of the, of the National Association of Manufacturers. I'm actually a director and I'm chair of the International Economic Affairs Policy Group at the NAM. And first, I just want to share with you, you know, manufacturing, uh, when, you, when you listen to a lot of people, it's, well, gee, we're losing all our manufacturing jobs. Uh, we're sending all these jobs overseas. This is a terrible thing. You know, in our, in our business, uh, when you make uh, containers, um, you're shipping air. So what you really have to do is build plants and, and have manufacturing close to where the product's going to be filled. We can't make cans in, uh, in uh, Monticello, Indiana, and ship them to China. But we make lots of cans in China, and that market's growing rapidly, as is Brazil, as is uh, actually Eastern Europe and other places. So I think that uh, understanding maybe where, where manufacturing is in this country, and I think uh, giving it a boost is, is really important. Charles, I'm glad you're doing that in, in, in Elkhart. Uh, first, the, the U.S. is the world's largest manufacturing economy. We produce about 21 percent of global manufactured products. Japan is second at 13 percent, and China third at 12 percent. Uh, we produce uh, 1.6 trillion dollars worth of value every year. That's about 11.2 percent of GDP. Manufacturing supports an estimated 18.6 million jobs in the U.S., about one in six private sector jobs. In 2009, the average U.S. manufacturing worker earned 74 thousand, I have this pretty precisely, $447, including pay and benefits. The average non-manufacturing worker earned $63,507. U.S. manufacturers are, are, are really the most productive workers in the world. At breakfast, we were talking about uh, getting more for less, becoming more productive. That's been a great engine. And uh, I think that uh, we're about twice as productive as workers in the next 10 leading manufacturing economies. I think I'm supposed to have a thing up here. Let's see. Does this work? Yeah. It's coming. Anyway, uh, we perform uh, half of all the research and development in the nation, uh, driving more innovation uh, than any other sector. And we believe that America really needs a manufacturing strategy that takes a comprehensive view of the policies required for U.S. manufacturing to succeed in the face of global competition. I'm screwed up, there we go. Um, this strategy really uh, sets high goals. And, and I just go over these three points with you. And, and uh, unfortunately, this is not the case today. But I think that we need to move in this direction. I've got a few, few ideas about, uh, that are reflected in these remarks about how we might help do that. Really, the U.S. should be, in my opinion, the best country in the world to headquarter a company. You know, secondly, we should be the, a great place to manufacture, you know, to meet 
the needs of, of uh, the American market and then to serve as an export platform for the world. The U.S., thirdly, should be the best country in the world in which to innovate, performing the bulk of a company's research and development activity. We don't necessarily have that today, but I think that's, it's clear to me that we should and can. The, the manufacturing strategy that, that I'm talking to you about proposes policy changes that would allow manufacturers in the U.S. to compete effectively in the global marketplace. I want to discuss a few of these proposed changes. First, uh, on taxation, I had this up just a minute ago. We've heard some commentary about taxes. Um, this strategy really proposes policies to bring America more closely in alignment uh, with major, major manufacturing competitors. When you look at this chart, uh, what you see is uh, uh, what has been happening since 1988 and uh, what we would uh, think would bring us uh, more in line. In, in 1988, the average uh, OECD tax rate was about 45 percent. The U.S. was actually below that. You can see the march downward to now where it's about 25 percent. We're still 40. And this is a big deal in terms of uh, if you want to get companies to headquarter here, we can go into the why of that later. But that's not the way to do it. I think this is one where we actually do maybe generate more revenue if we could get more competitive in the world. Um, I think next uh, spring, Japan is set to reduce its rate. Uh, it was the only, only major country in the world that uh, had a rate higher than the U.S., and it will be then the highest rate in the world, the highest corporate tax rate. Uh, this kind of policy flies in the face, I think, of, of achieving these objectives that I put on the, state, on the uh, piece of paper. We also need to reduce trade barriers. And, and open U.S. markets. Um, I think that, uh, here's a slide that goes the other direction, but uh, to explain it just a little bit, uh, as you see the U.S., if, if the export intensity is a 1.0, defined as what is in the U.S., you see all the, all the rest of the countries listed here are exporting a bigger proportion of what they make than we are. You know, we believe we should have a goal of doubling exports within five years. Um, this strategy also calls for action on critical priorities such as energy, uh, infrastructure, and regulation. Recent events in the Middle East and North Africa certainly show us how important a sensible, comprehensive energy policy for the country is. This is an interesting slide, uh, I think. Uh, this shows 2004 regulatory costs broken down by category. Now, I'm sorry we don't have more recent data. But I feel confident that uh, the costs are higher today. Wow, that's over a trillion dollars. We heard how many thousands of years it takes at a million a day to get there. That we're spending 1.1 trillion, you know, seven years ago, uh, regulating ourselves. And it just seems to me that we could use uh, more honest people and fewer rules. And I think it's up to each and every one of us to, uh, to carry that message and to think about it and to behave in ways that foster getting to that place. As I stated er earlier, uh, we, we really ought to take seriously removing ineffective regulation. With respect to innovation, which uh, Charles talked a lot about, for America to innovate, we've got to be able to compete. We, we favor uh, strengthening uh, and making permanent the research and development tax credit. It, it seems to me that uh, we've been talking about this uh, since I joined Ball over 40 years ago. Uh, why can't we get it done, you know? This, uh, this particular slide talks about a simulation that was run uh, looking at uh, making permanent the, the R&D tax credit and, and actually increasing it by 25 percent and the number of jobs per year that could be uh, created, you know, if we do that. Um, you know, it's uh, over a half million jobs a year within, uh, within a few years. And then doing that does create this innovation uh, engine that uh, leads to the development of the economy that we need. Next, uh, we really need to re recognize that intellectual property is one of the United States' competitive strengths that must be defended at all levels, domestically and globally. Uh, U.S. Uh, intellectual property is estimated to be worth between five and five and a half trillion dollars. Again, we all know now what a trillion is. Yet, the continuing trade in counterfeit 
products results in the loss of hundreds of thousands of jobs annually. In the wake of uh, the last election, I think there are some reasons for optimism, maybe pendulum swinging or whatever. Uh, jobs, the economy, and taxes are always important, but the public is also paying more attention to manufacturing. Candidates all across the country ran on a platform of manufacturing jobs, and the results speak for themselves. President Obama has turned more to business for economic insight and leadership, naming manufacturers to key advisory posts. Last year, manufacturing jobs added jobs for the first time since 1997. Now, employment grew by about 1.2 percent. That's only 136,000 jobs. It's not a lot, and we were coming from a low place, but at least it was in the right direction. We think that uh, this year, I think economists are estimating maybe a 2.5 percent growth in manufacturing employment. That's another 330,000 jobs. You've got a long way to go, but we need to continue to have uh, strategies in place that, that foster this. I just return to, uh, to these three points. I think that pursuing a strategy to make the U.S. the best place to headquarter a company, to uh, make it a great place to manufacture goods, and finally to, to make it the best country in the world in which to innovate is just vitally important to returning to a healthy economy and to helping ensure the future of this great country. Uh, a practical and focused relationship in the middle between business and government will be vital to achieving the implementation of this strategy. Thank you very much. David, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Kevin Cabot. Kevin is president and CEO of Fifth Third Bank Corp. Uh, Fifth Third headquartered in Cincinnati, but uh, of course has uh, a major presence in Indiana and a number of other states. It is one of the uh, top 20 largest bank holding companies in the United States with some $115 billion in assets and some 22,000 employees in 12 states. Kevin uh, is a uh, Johns Hopkins University and a Purdue University graduate. We laud him for the former accomplishment, and we forgive him for the second. <laughs> they told me to say that. Kevin Cabot. Thank you, Gary. My, uh, my ability to be here really rests with my daughter, who is an IU uh, alumni. So uh, I'm, I think I'm forgiven. <laughs> Now, the other thing I will mention is that, you know, what that taught me is that my daughter gets to go, I, you, I get to go, I owe you. <laughs> so it all balances out in the end. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I, uh, I, I want to just make a couple of quick comments uh, uh, to Charles. Uh, I'm actually 29 years old. <laughs> the, the crisis was a little bit more um, challenging in the financial <laughs> world than maybe. <clears throat> so looks, looks can be deceiving. Uh, but I am delighted to be here. It is a pleasure. I, I did spend many years in this state, in the great state of Indiana. I did graduate. Uh, I did attend graduate school here. And I actually started my banking career right here in Indianapolis, uh, a, a bank that used to uh, share a room in the Hyatt. Uh, was my uh, was my original bank. It had a green briefcase for those of you that have been around long enough. So, uh, I've been asked uh, to speak to you today about really managing through tough times and about the proper balance between uh, government regulation and intervention in the free market. Uh, and after the last few years, the thing I'd start with is that I feel ultimately expert on one of these topics, not so much on the other. And I believe you'll be able to tell which uh, after I get through my talk. Uh, but there have been and there continue to be many uh, perspectives. You've already heard a number of them so far this morning regarding the cause of the crisis. There are many books and experts uh, with their perspective on that. Uh, but I think it's important uh, to at least give you uh, some of my perspective of the causes, uh, albeit a biased one. And this one will come from a traditional bank, a mainstream bank, which is what we are. That's a little bit different than what you heard Charles talk about, and you'll get the difference in a second. But at times, I get the question, uh, probably more often than I, I care to, but uh, as to who's to blame for the financial meltdown and the subsequent recession. And the best answer that I can give is that, quite frankly, uh, everyone's to blame, whether it's government, unregulated lenders, credit agencies, investment banks, regulators, borrowers, and yes, even traditional commercial banks like Fifth Third. 
all played a role, albeit some more than others. Without going into mind-numbing detail, but to try to put some context around the environment, let me go back to shortly after the tech bubble and the aftermath of 9-11, uh, the Federal Reserve significantly reduced interest rates in order to mitigate the negative impact of uh, recent events on the economy. Low bond rates, low interest rates, and skepticism of the stock market significantly increased the attractiveness of real estate as an investment vehicle. This factor, coupled with the GSEs that had a congressional mandate to increase home ownership, led to rapidly increasing real estate prices in many parts of the country. As property values rose, so did the availability of credit. The shadow banking system that you've all heard uh, reference to that was, uh, that was comprised of unregulated lenders and securitization markets began to account for more and more lending activity in the U.S. Peaking, and this is an incredible statistic to me, peaking at over 70% of all credit extended in the U.S. between 2003 and 2006. Now, this was further exacerbated by the emergence of new loan products that increased availability of credit, but were often done at teaser rates, required little money down, or completely circumvented most of the traditional underwriting process. Add to this the pressure from the regulatory bodies responsible to Congress for CRA and fair lending, comparing standard lending practices to alternative lending offers only compounded the problem. The majority of toxic loan products, such as option arms, subprime loans, exotic mortgages, which are all four-letter words today, were created by lenders completely outside of the traditional regulatory authority of agencies like the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, the OCC. And I note that uh, many traditional banks, like Fifth Third, did not originate these types of products. But we did compete in more vanilla categories that were being underwritten based on grossly inflated property values. Now, don't misinterpret my message. Traditional banks played a role. Our risk management processes were not developed enough to help us anticipate uh, and avoid the forthcoming problems. And we as an industry should have had a better understanding of the interconnectedness of our business to all that was to ensue. The rest is history. Teaser rates began to expire, property values began to decline, and we began to see more and more borrowers unable to pay their mortgages. Given that consumer savings in America were at the lowest level since the government began tracking the statistic in the 1950s, many people had little, if any, contingency funds to fall back on. With the fall of large banks such as IndyMac, Washington Mutual, and Lehman Brothers, liquidity dried up and panic ensued. Ultimately, lack of effective oversight of the shadow banking system and congressional overreaching in housing policy played a large role in the crisis. But so too did banks continuing to compete for loans well past the point where it made economic sense. It's important to remember that at this time, fear was rampant that the banking system would collapse and that all banks would be nationalized. It truly seemed that the world was teetering on the brink of disaster. Even to me, it seems hard to believe the severity of the events and the negative sentiment that was pervasive at the time. I, Charles, could show you a clip of the president talking about us, but he was using bank as a four-letter word. <laughs> <laughs> so showing it to this group is probably not good. As a result of that time frame, though, the Bush administration and Congress implemented the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act in early October 2008. This bill was designed to restore liquidity and consumer confidence in the financial markets. The most well-known component of this bill was the Troubled Asset Relief Program. <clears throat> you all know it as TARP, which was initially designed to enable the U.S. Treasury to purchase preferred shares in healthy U.S. banks. That's not initially what it was designed for. That's what it turned into. And while we were initially relieved about our participation in the program, we were the last of the big top 19 banks in the country to take TARP, we soon learned that TARP carried a uh, stigma for participating banks. It was common to hear the word bailout associated with the program. The truth is, TARP was never a bailout. It was an investment made by the government and banks of all sizes to shore up their capital position and encourage them to make loans to help spur the U.S. economy. Liquidity had dried up. As we stated last month, 
uh, as was stated last month, the U.S. Treasury will, in fact, not only be repaid by bank-specific TARP funds, and I'm very specific about what I'm referring to, bank-specific TARP funds, it will make a tidy profit. As an example, upon our complete repay repayment of TARP, Fifth Third Bank also paid to U.S. taxpayers a total of $345 million in preferred dividends. It's not a bad business. In theory, the concept of TARP was a good thing. It was all about restoring confidence in the system. In reality, it became, as one of my colleagues uh, deemed it, a scarlet letter. Was TARP necessary? I could make arguments on both sides. And with the goal, when the goal of legislation and government intervention is to protect consumers or achieve a shared goal, we willingly accept certain limitations on our business model. However, there are situations when the legislation is specifically designed to hamper efforts to provide the best service to our customers or in delivering value to our shareholders. The latest government regulation is a good example. The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act that you hear about today includes more than 2,000 pages of text and result in the formation of 50 separate task forces, most of which uh, won't even complete their initial findings until later this year. And while Dodd-Frank appears to be Congress' latest effort to pull the economy back from the brink, we're having difficulty in seeing how some of it even relates to the crisis. We can't even imagine the future implication of this bill to our customers, our company, our shareholders, or even the larger perspective of the economy as a whole. Probably the best example that I would point to you is, of this comes from the now infamous Durbin Amendment uh, portion of the bill. The Durbin Amendment, for those of you that don't know, is the debit interchange fee restriction designed to regulate interchange fees through price controls. Interchange fees are the fees merchants pay to card issuing banks to have the ability to accept debit card payments. Now the last time I checked, interchange fees didn't relate in any way to the financial crisis. And yet the Durbin Amendment is showing that it's an overreaction by Congress in an attempt by government to fix something that's not broken. While it's premature to estimate the, the actual financial impact of this amendment alone, uh, the Financial Services Roundtable estimates that if left unaltered, the proposal would remove an estimated $15 billion from the financial services marketplace. Now, this would have a significant impact on the payments network as banks would essentially be required to offer this service below cost. We'd be losing money on every transaction. If this amendment is implemented as currently written, we would expect significant impact and changes made within and throughout the industry, something that I think may qualify as the law of unintended consequences. <laughs> now, while Fifth Third Bank's committed to making the regulatory changes that follow from Dodd-Frank work for the American economy, we remain concerned that certain regulations are designed to impede our business rather than help it. Finding the proper balance between government intervention and the free market is a distinct challenge. It's always been that way, particularly in our business. We advocate for and support reform and changes and even regulation that will protect consumers as well as enable us to do what we do best, run our company and create value for our customers and our shareholders. It's no secret that too much let regulation, like price controls, for example, can make it harder for us to operate and have unintended consequences. So let me finish, uh, change the topic just for a second. The past three years were not the most ideal time uh, for, to be a CEO of a financial institution. And while the experience has been a difficult one, I do believe that good leaders rise to the challenge. Uh, I would have preferred to be CEO in a much calmer time, but you deal, you play the cards you're dealt. And my hand involved leading our company and our 22,000 employees through a tumultuous time, a time of uncertainty. And while things are much calmer now, uh, as I shared with you, government regulation keeps many things unclear and challenging as we go in the future. So how does one lead in, in uncertain times? Well, let me just share a couple of things that I learned and used. Fo first of all, focus on the things that you can change. Don't waste time worrying about the things that you can't change. When the house is burning, looking for the match, doesn't help. Worrying about what's going on in Washington didn't help us with business in Cincinnati, Indianapolis, or Orlando. Control the things that you can control. Second, prioritize. Business as usual when it's not doesn't help. Know that you have to make hard decisions 
oftentimes speed matters. So accelerating processes and changes need to be prioritized and dealt with. Third, create a, vo a vocal shared objective for everyone. Knowing what it is you're focused on helps you achieve buy-in, hope, focus. Our market cap in, at the bottom of the crisis uh, was under a billion dollars. Today it's 14 billion, or roughly. Um, you, you could have bought us, yeah, at a very cheap price. Keeping people focused is, in, is incredibly important. And finally, as prepared as you are, there is no playbook, no training manual or graduate degree for this type of crisis. As hard as you try, you can never be 100% prepared for what may happen. So knowing that and accepting that moving on is incredibly important. And the last thing I would tell you is keep your balance. Keep your family, keep your health, keep your friends close, and things will stay in perspective. During the peak of the crisis, my son, who is a captain in the U.S. Army, while I was battling the financial crisis, he was leading troops in Iraq for 15 months. So believe it or not, with all that I went through and all that we went through for the financial crisis, I wouldn't have changed places with him. And God bless him, because he helped me keep things in control. Thank you. Great comments. Thank you, Kevin, very much. Final speaker is Derricka Rice. Derricka is a uh, Kelly graduate, Executive Vice President of Global Services and Chief Financial Officer at Indi uh, Eli Lilly and Company. Derricka serves uh, on numerous corporate and civic boards, including the Indiana University Board of Trustees. In 2009, he was selected as one of the most powerful executives in corporate America by Black Enterprise Magazine and has been tabbed by Diversity Magazine as one of its top 100 under 50 executives. Please join me in welcoming Derricka Rice. Good morning. Give me a little feedback. Good morning. <laughs> okay. I know I'm the last one and I'm standing between you and the break, but then we get to come back for class participation, I think. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, I think Professor Boquist told me that he would not disclose my grades for my <laughs> days at IU. So that was one of the conditions. But for me, it's truly an honor to be here and to be a part of the 65th annual Indiana University Business Conference. And I must say that 65 years, to me at least, I'm a little older, but still an impressive run and a tribute to the Kelly School of Business. Uh, today, I'm very happy to share my perspective based on over 20 years at Eli Lilly and Company. Now, some of what I have to say would apply to any company in this state or country, how our relationship with government is intimately bound up with our ability to make investments in our business, provide good jobs, and compete in a global market. But at Lilly, we also have a very special relationship with governments. We're actually in an industry that is highly regulated. And in our case, this is one where the government is not only our regulator, but it's also our largest customer. So for the lawyers in the room, think about the conflict of interest. We're also in a business where we must invest 10 to 20 years in advance and at a billion plus dollars to bring a new medicine to market. Even as we seek reimbursement for our current products from government health care authorities facing the intense pressures of annual budgets. I represent a pharmaceutical company that has staked its future on innovation. When frankly, some others are looking to hedge their bets with big mergers, big cutbacks in R&D, or big moves into generics. So I'm going to focus quite a bit on the role of innovation in the relationship between business and government. Now, like other companies represented here today, we at Lilly take very seriously our role in society and our relationship with government. Now, generally, when you hear the discussions of the role and responsibilities of business, they center around providing jobs, paying taxes, and contributing to the economy. And I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to note that Lilly is a part of the growing Indiana life sciences industry, comprising of more than 1,600 businesses that pay a typical average wage of $82,000. Now that's more than double the average in our state. Now what I think gets overlooked is that in our industry, and probably all of yours, we are able to provide jobs and pay taxes because we create value. We provide products and services that people appreciate, 
as confirmed by the price that they pay in the market. And I would also further argue a big part of the value that we create comes from innovation. So it's critical that society views the relationship between business and government not simply in terms of what we contribute now, but rather than what we can contribute in the future. Or if I could put it a different way or a different twist on a few key words in the title of our conversation, the greater good, I like to focus not just on the good things we in business must do today, but the greater good we can produce tomorrow. And how the proper relationship between business and government nurtures that opportunity, that potential. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So let me start with the basics. First and foremost, in our relationship with government, we want the opportunity to offer innovative products to customers and let the market be the judge of value. For our part, we must be willing to succeed or fail solely on the value we create. So yes, we depend on free markets. But that's not as simple as saying the government should get out of the way. Our ability to operate in the market or to plan and to invest for the future requires that government maintain solid protection of intellectual property, which is a fair, rigorous, and transparent system of regulation and a predictable tax structure that allows us to compete in global markets. It is all of these elements that are essential to our ability to innovate and to contribute the benefits of innovation to society. Now, let me take a brief look at each of these elements. For a business like ours, intellectual property is our most essential asset, and we absolutely depend on governments to protect those rights. And let me add, since lately there's been a lot of debate about whether the federal government is acting outside of its constitutional authority, this is actually enumerated in the power of Congress in Article I, Section 8, and I quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and innovators the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Now, it was that important 220 years ago to grant explicit authority in the Constitution, and it is just as important today. We also look to the U.S. government to promote the protection of intellectual property rights in other countries and to enforce laws against counterfeiting, and not only for our economic protection, but also for the safety of everyone who uses our medicines. It's one thing to pirate a DVD. It's another to take or sell a fake medicine. Who would want to encounter that? Now, when it comes to intellectual property protection, the devil is clearly in details. And I'm sure there will always be disputes in Congress and courts about what is fair. But I would argue that we have a very good example of how government and business can work out solutions that benefit society. Maybe not the example you were expecting from me here today, but one, that's the ability, but one that I think will resonate with you. And that's the availability of generic drugs. Now indeed, wider use of generics have been one of the few bright spots in healthcare spending over the past several years. It was back in 1984, Congress passed the Hatch-Waxman Act, which was intended to promote generics while maintaining financial incentives for drug innovation. Today, a quarter century later, the U.S. leads the world in the development of new medicines. At the same time, Americans can get access with a fairly well-defined time period to low-priced generic versions of innovative medicines developed in this country. It may surprise you that generics account for 75% of all prescriptions written in the U.S. And the prices of the generics, on average, is around 75% lower than that of the branded drugs themselves. Again, these generic medicines are the legacy of innovative pharmaceutical companies like ours. Now, the new health care reform law creates a similar approach for so-called biosimilars, copied versions of new medicines developed through biotechnology. This new law creates the first pathway to market for biosimilars in the U.S. At the same time, it provides companies like Lilly, where biotech accounts for a growing share of our clinical portfolio, an important period of exclusivity, 
with 12 years of protection for our clinical data for innovative biological treatments. Now, Lilly supported this provision. We see biosimilars, like generics, as a valuable potential legacy of our work. But there will be no new medicines worth copying unless companies like ours have the ability to earn a return on our investment in research. A second key element of our relationship with government is a fair and rigorous and transparent system of regulation. This is how we create trust and confidence in our medical system. We invest several years and hundreds of millions of dollars in the final phases of drug development to, to conduct clinical tests of a potential medicine's safety and its efficacy. We rely on an expectation that our compound will be assessed on the basis of a consistent and predictable regulatory and scientific approach. We also count on a timely review process as the clock is ticking on our period of IP protection and the opportunity to market our product before the entry of generic competition that I mentioned previously. Now, for our part, we must build a constructive relationship with regulators. And in light of heightened public concerns about safety, support regulators' efforts to appropriately balance the benefits and risks of potential medicines. We must communicate with regulators and anticipate their concerns so that we can answer their questions in clinical testing. A third element of the relationship between business and government is a consistent tax structure, one that allows us to compete in global markets and plan and invest for the future. Now, reforming the corporate tax code is a critical ingredient for what ails, I believe, the U.S. economy. Now, in January, I participated with other CFOs in a discussion with Treasury Secretary Geithner on an agenda of tax reform. Now, we talked about the importance of inserting consistency and certainty into our tax system, which we do not have right now. We also discussed some important principles of tax reform, such as stimulating job growth, eliminating complexity in the tax code. Has anyone tried to read the tax code lately? Can, in fact, can any one of you complete your own tax returns lately? As well as lowering the corporate tax rate and aligning U.S. corporate taxes with those of other countries. Now, a good example is the Federal Research and Development Tax Credit. We need to make the R&D tax credit permanent and raise it to levels that are globally competitive. Late last year, Congress renewed the R&D tax credit for only two years, retroactively for 2010, so was that really going forward or going backwards, and looking forward to only through 2011. But with, I believe without a permanent renewal, it's very difficult for companies to confidently, confidently plan for the future. We need a business tax system that levels the playing field for American companies that compete worldwide. Currently, U.S. companies face a higher corporate tax rate than our global competitors. And unlike those competitors, we must also pay U.S. taxes on our foreign earnings, meaning our earnings earned outside of the U.S. We need a corporate tax system like the rest of the world, one that encourages rather than discourages investment in the United States. Now, this is, then it is up to us to make productive investments and that create value, provide jobs, and generate a flow of tax revenue back to the government. Now, in addition to these policies that I've discussed so far, which really apply across all business sectors, there is one more element of relationship between business and government that I believe is particular to research-based companies like Lilly. The private biopharmaceutical sector, of which we're a part, has historically had a synergistic relationship with basic research funded by, the federal government, funded by the federal government and conducted in academic and government labs. Now, this basic research provides the raw material, the substrate, such as insights on disease processes and leads on promising molecules. It is then pharmaceutical companies that apply that knowledge to develop and commercialize innovative products that create value in the market. I believe this is a great example of a positive relationship between business and government. What we bring to the relationship is a massive investment on our part in research and development. And because our future depends on innovation, we're committed to maintaining our investment in R&D, even, even through the lean years. 
Now, we need the same commitment at the federal level to maintain a well-funded basic research infrastructure within academic and government labs. Now, throughout my remarks, I've highlighted the critical importance of maintaining a relationship between government and business that realizes the full potential of innovation. There is no better case study than the global health care crisis. Now, I'm going to get into the B's and the T's. Countries around the world face a huge demand on their health care systems from aging populations. Now, let me offer just one example. There was a recent report written that said, if we do not find successful treatments for Alzheimer's disease, the total cost of the disease in the U.S. will be $20 trillion by the year 2050. That's trillion with a T. But what if we do find successful treatments? There was a study in the UK that suggested if scientists develop a treatment to delay the progression of dementia and thus reduce the percentage of older people with severe dementia by just 1% per year, this advance could offset all projected increases in long-term care costs for Britain's aging population. That's a reduction of 1% per year and it can offset all of the increased long-term care costs of the aging population in just one country. This is the value that innovation can bring to society, not only in terms of the economic good that it does, but also in terms of the human health care good that it does. Innovation is not a panacea for the, all the challenges facing our health care systems, but clearly it is hard to see any way out of our current crisis without innovation. Now, to sustain the investment necessary to develop more new medicines, companies like Lilly must have the opportunity to earn a return on the innovative medicines we successfully bring to market. Now, the government health care policy, particularly where the government is the payer, is critical to our ability to earn a share of the value we create. But first, we must successfully develop medicines that truly create value, that alleviate unmet medical needs, and improve outcomes of individual patients. That's what society, society expects of us. That is what we expect of ourselves. It is the full potential of companies like Lilly is not the good that we produce today, meaning the medicines we offer, the jobs we provide, the taxes and economic growth we contribute, but rather the greater good that we can do tomorrow. By developing breakthrough treatments that improve human health, and help societies around the world meet rising demands on their health care resources. A productive relationship with government is a key to our success, both for our company and for our society. And we will continue to strive to hold up our end of the bargain. Thank you for your time. Erica, thank you very much, and uh, to all of our speakers as well for providing some thought-provoking perspective for our panel discussion, which will be coming up after a, um, after a short break. Um, and re a reminder, too, we want you to participate. You'll be able to submit questions, and uh, Stephen Hayford will explain that in just a little bit. But this is your chance right now for a short break, your chance to grab another cup of coffee, maybe make a quick call to the office, but make it quick because we will reconvene here in, uh, in 15 minutes at 11 o'clock sharp. Thank you.